Well, hello, that's me again. Today is November 10th, and uh, let's get to our goal, so to speak, without any procrastination. And before I go, I deliberately uh, made sure that I had the conversation uh, after I was invited by Gonzalo Lira with me and b wonderful Brian Berletich, and uh, we were discussing the issue of uh, 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 song. And I will leave the uh, direct link uh, to our conversation this morning, uh, you know, below in the description of this video. So let's get to the um, issue of her son and absolutely unhealthy uh, the dose of hysteria and mis uh, misinterpretation of what is going on there. I agree, however, from the get-go that the optics of it is not good for Russia. But again, it's the optics primarily, because obviously wars are a little bit different um, business than merely PR. And let's start again, and I want to dispel immediately one of the myths and basically lies and propaganda which is being perpetrated and spewed around by all kinds of uh, Western media and of course trolls and people from Ipso. Let me remind you this. You see this? This is the map of the flooding inundation in case of the Kahovka Dam is uh, basically destroyed and the uh, uh, Kahovka Reservoir begins to empty towards Kherson. Uh, this is the map which was done very recently and it actually stated that even if to consider the drawing down of the water and Russia was draining water from Kahovka reservoir which is a very large reservoir you can look it up on uh, Google Maps even under these conditions you would get approximately the extension of the inundation uh, like this look at this as you can see yourself, this white line from Kherson to basically the parallel, if you draw roughly a line which goes in parallel with Dnieper River, uh, it would extend to the uh, average of 16-15 kilometers there. And if you look, look at the Antonovka Bridge there, the yellow line there, you have to understand that it's actually merely 1.4 kilometers or roughly one uh, uh, mile and uh, compared to uh, the Antonovka Bridge, you have the extent of the water surface up to, well, 10 times. So in this particular case, guess what? The Kherson becomes unsupplyable in any case, and it becomes obviously indefensible. And here's what I want to make sure that people make no mistake about it, and because I myself already got sick and tired listening to this bullshit, because obviously Mr. Suravikin, the first day when he took command of the special military operation on the October 8th, already stated that we are ready to make difficult decisions which of course was met then with gasp in Russia, but everybody understood that the issue will be the defense or capability or ability to defend uh, the uh, Kherson and Plotsdarm on the right side of the Dnieper River. And now people started to talk about the, uh, all kinds of the stupid things that which never happened actually and which influenced supposedly the decision. Here is the decision from yesterday. This is from RIA News and let me translate it for you. And that means Soravikin explained the necessity of the uh, uh, removal of the troops to the left of um, um, shore of the Dnieper. Uh, what is marked or highlighted in yellow reads like this. During the uh, breakthrough or destruction of the uh, Kahovka dam, of the Kahovka hydroelectric plant, the threat of the full isolation of the Russian troops on the right uh, shore on the right bank of the Dnieper arises. This is what the uh, uh, commanding officer of the unified grouping of uh, Russian troops, Sergei Suravikin, reported to Minister of Defense of Russian Federation, Sergei Shegu. And this was the main argument and the main cause uh, of his uh, uh, proposition to remove the troops to the left bank. 
And while I still give them all kind of propagandists, maybe this a little bit that optics are not good for the public opinion court, militarily it is completely justifiable. And most importantly, as I already stated a long time ago, and everybody actually already knew then that the dam uh, is the main factor there. Because once it's broken, even if to consider that it's uh, the wave, initial wave, which should be four meters high, which will roll down towards the, towards her son, uh, should be probably less now, maybe even two meters, because the sump drainage of the water was ongoing. It is still a catastrophic event, and the, uh, basically the hint from the get-go was the fact which I learned about, I knew there was evacuation, I knew that from her son, which was uh, ongoing since the start of Shoravik in taking the command. But the number of people evacuated, uh, civilians evacuated from Kherson in the last months is 115,000 people. The population of Kherson prior to the military operation actually in 2021 was around 280,000 plus minus. With the start of this operation in the February, there was a very large number of the population of Kherson, which were primarily pro-Ukrainian, pro-Kiev regime, who moved out. Nobody knows exact number, but even already then, uh, the people were, it's, you can easily find it confirmation in any pretty much outlet, which was uh, a news outlet, which was operating uh, in Kherson, that the city was kind of semi-empty. So, and from what we know, and now that we have the number specifically stated by Mr. Soravikin, two Minister of Defense of Russian Federation, that 115,000 civilians have been evacuated. So if you even have the number of people who were remained uh, after the operation started in February this year, so we're looking at around maybe, I don't know, 70, 80, maybe even more percent of the population, civilian population, which has been evacuated, thus pretty much leaving Kherson as an empty shell of a city. And here's the issue. Optics are bad, sure. Militarily makes total sense. And now, when you uh, listen to even such uh, people who are not really mentally adequate, like Mr. Padalyak, the aide of Zelensky, and other people from Ukrainian side, saying, no, 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 let's not rush, let's not do this thing, you know, who knows what they did. And you have all kinds of the Western outlets saying, that, yeah, yeah, don't rush in Kherson, it could be a trap. This is why I uh, mentioned this to, uh, uh, to you guys in the beginning, because we had a wonderful discussion today with uh, excellent Brian Berletich and Gonzalo Lira about this whole situation in Kherson. So please don't hesitate to follow this link and listen to what we did in terms of, of course, speculation. Nobody, none of us have any access to the actual data on the ground, and we do not under, uh, basically know what um, Russian general staff uh, is planning, but there is no doubt that if you recall my older videos, I constantly stress, look at the terrain around Kherson, starting from Duchane to uh, Nikolaev. If you draw the arc between those two uh, uh, places, you will see yourself that you have about 55 something of this nature, kilometers, which you already saw many times in the videos, of the empty land. It's a farm land with some strips of, not even forests, just merely trees and bushes. And basically, now for Ukraine to take, so to speak, uh, empty Kherson pretty much, what it would take is to move appropriate forces in full uh, force into the columns, towards Kherson and thus exposing them to the open terrain. Uh, average uh, speed of any kind of column, uh, if you take it, uh, you know, especially considering the terrain, and I don't know what is the state of the ground right now there, we're looking at about, with the tanks and all that, probably about 20-25 kilometers per hour. This is the march speed of the columns. Uh, maybe uh, BTRs, uh, you know, those uh, armored personnel carriers, they can uh, drive faster, 
maybe 30 kilometers per hour. But if you consider the distance between uh, Nikolaev, where the main uh, 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 forces of arm, uh, uh, forces of Ukraine, not even the main forces of Ukraine anymore, the most of it, a huge number of it, are so-called volunteers, foreign uh, foreign people, NATO uh, personnel. So um, you're looking at what? Roughly 55 divided by 25. Um, you look at at least two hours driving towards Kherson under open conditions. You can bet your ass that obviously those routes or routes and obviously places are already very well sighted by Russian artillery and Russian MLRS. So um, yeah, good luck. And then of course they need to deal some uh, to, to deal with the empty city, which who knows what is in there. And again, don't ask me. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. That's the other thing, you know, which I constantly uh, stress. Don't ask me about what General Staff thinks. Meanwhile, meanwhile, since we have it, and since this Kherson thing will or is kind of occupying many people, which is understandable, make no mistake, I am not trying to spin things. Uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, we already know the numbers, basically, of uh, Mr. Putin himself stated it yesterday, that basically 50,000 of the new troops have already arrived to the front, 80,000 of them are within the rear of the, that means in the Donbass Republic's training, uh, while training and developing the combat cohesion of their formations. And as you already know, the, uh, another 170, 180 should be ready by December, I think. So make your own conclusion where they will be sent and what is going to happen. I don't know. We can speculate only. But since we address this Kherson thing, and uh, let me also address the other thing which completely dominates all this uh, discussion. And l look at this. One of the panic and hysterical outbursts uh, was about Maria Zaharova talking about the uh, negotiations with Ukraine. Everybody was just almost panicking. Wow, Russia is now, you know, on its knees and she's ready to negotiate. Well, I read what Zaharova stated. She stated nothing new which Mr. Putin didn't state or Mr. Lavrov didn't state. So let's take a look at what she stated. And guess what? Here's the today's headline from RT. Moscow sets out conditions for talks with EU. This is with EU, not with Ukraine. But look what Zaharova states. She noted that Western calls to seek a diplomatic solution to the Ukraine conflict unfortunately are just a rhetoric, adding that all EU policies, including military support for Ukraine, are aimed at escalation. Uh, pretty clear, isn't it? So, but look what she does next. According to Zaharova, Moscow is open to discussing ways out of current crisis, but any peace settlement must be of some benefit to Russia. It is important that any proposal take into account the real situation on the ground and have an added value to, uh, for our country, she noted. What does she mean about the, uh, taking uh, uh, into account the real situation? Let me decipher it for you, for those people who think that it is somehow related to her song withdrawal. It has nothing to do with her song, uh, with her song withdrawal, and it has everything to do with the fact that Russia has now four new areas, including her song region, including full Donbass region, including the uh, Zaporozhye region, that they are now the part of Russian Federation, not to mention the Crimea, obviously. And the reality on the ground is such that those things are not for negotiations and Russia is not going to negotiate on this issue. Period. This is what she talks about. After that, well, everybody knows that United States have been, uh, well, pretty hectic and I would say even bipolar in the last few days with Washington Post, the New York Times, then Wall Street Journal of all uh, places dropping all those info bombs that actually the uh, US administration and Jack Sullivan, they were in contact with Russia and everything to such a point that actually Mr. Lavrov had to state uh, that actually we didn't discuss, uh, you know, Ukraine with the United States. Most of the talks were uh, 
about the uh, basically the escalation and uh, United States, the American side, w wanted to actually make sure that United States and Russia do not clash. Well, that is laudable, obviously, you know, that's good, good. They begin to kind of, you know, get some idea what is this all about. But it might be too late in terms of the, this situation. And um, as I already stated, Russia... Uh, is in uh, the whole uh, business of, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, of their uh, special military operations, is not just the fight, and I constantly repeat it, and it's annihilation of Kiev regime and its full demilitarization. This demilitarization, and again, uh, listen to what we discussed with Brian Berletich today, it's all about also the demilitarization of NATO. Because obviously uh, NATO is at the end of the rope, so to speak, including the United States. But it is also about Russia quitting, demolishing the present institutions which have been established by NATO or by the United States. They either have to be reformed or they will be abandoned. And this also relates to all those kinds of, as I already stated, uh, rating agencies, you know, the, um, even the United Nations, the way the whole thing which is set up like the uh, International Monetary Fund, uh, World Bank, the way they operate, they operate as uh, robbers or their rubber stamps for the United States interests. And because of that, for example, Russians never cared about if they were in G7 and G20 also is the idea of the Western world of the United States. Vladimir Putin finally today stated that he is not going to G20 and I applaud this decision. There is nothing to discuss there with who, if you want uh, to ask me. Europe is absolutely a non is not a subject of the international relations. It's an object. They are lap dogs of the United States. United States is dying in you know trying to prevent any kind of meeting between Putin and uh, Mr. Biden. And of course, <clears throat> Russia can uh, have open contacts, bilateral contacts with China, India, Turkey, and other places which really matter. And that's the whole point. Why would Putin go there? Apart from the fact I, for example, as a Russian, if I would be a Russian uh, security service or any professional who is dealing with the uh, military and political issues in Russia, I would feel very uncomfortable flying uh, Mr. Putin halfway around the world into wherever is going to be held, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, doesn't matter, I don't really care, but it's like, it's 15 hour flight, guys, over one of the most unhospitable terrain, you know, you have to uh, um, circumnavigate the, uh, you know, Tibet, and Himalayas, because nobody flies over them, and there are all kinds of things there, you know, so good that Vladimir Putin stays at home, and he shouldn't honor this bunch of uh, collection of people there anyhow, you know, if Russia needs to talk to India, China, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, it's telephone, you just pick up the phone, and you talk, there you go, and you don't want to risk the life of the leader of the what is becoming the free world. So this is a great decision and it's also in many respects diminishes the importance of G20 because I mean discuss what stupid climate uh, hoax or you know, so you, you make your own conclusions on this matter. But but obviously United States wouldn't be United States if it wouldn't try to present uh, itself as some kind of very important, which it really is not that important anymore except for the provocations. But look at this. Even uh, the uh, United States and Wall Street Journal reports on this uh, uh, refuses to send advanced drones to Ukraine. According to U.S. officials and people familiar with matter interviewed by a newspaper, the U.S. won't send the Gray Eagle MQ-1C drones to Ukraine that it has been requesting for months. This type of military aid, they said, could signal to Moscow that the U.S. was, US was providing weapons that could target positions inside Russia. Uh, start laughing here. Uh, start laughing uh, out loud because it's such a crock of shit that it's unbelievable. And I will explain to you why. U.S. officials also worried that the technology used in the drones, particularly the cameras, could fall into the wrong hands, the report says. Let me explain why the United States is not sending the drones. 
First, United States provides targeting and uh, basically situational and tactical awareness for the uh, for Ukraine, including targeting in the in, inside Russia already without any drones using other assets, including constant patrols of them. E3 Sentry, AVAX, and all kinds of other space-based assets. So this is preposterous. But the main reason they're not sending it, this drone is not that advanced. It's actually a classic recon drone. Well, good cameras maybe, good some signal, you know, collection uh, intel. But it is slow. It's 300 kilometers uh, an hour, which is what, 100. 60 something hundred uh, 70 miles per hour slow drone which fl should fly really high to get all this necessary signaling and all that signal uh, uh, intel and in, in easy target for Russian air defense or Russian air force. So United States doesn't need more embarrassment for its weapon systems and they know even if they provide those drones they will be shut down or some of them eventually will be sold to as Ukrainians do all the time you know to even op uh, opposing side. So it has nothing to do with uh, Russia being targeted because Russia is targeted every day, every single day. And here is another thing which shows you how much uh, basically the technological toying and really confused way of looking, of looking at modern war by the United States manifests itself. This is uh, the, one of the cases when you really have, as I'm doing now, scratch your ha head and ask why. I mean, how the hell they came up with this bullshit because it makes no technological or other sense. And here it is. This happened today. And look at this. So, uh, they launched this whatever the dragon thing is called, basically, and breaking video, United States Special Operations Europe, they, you know, video from 350 seconds, Special Operation Wing, successful test fire of Politeich Joint Air to Surface Standoff Missile, which is known as JASM, Successful Extraction or Deployment Box. Look what their uh, dude who is in charge of this uh, uh, preposterous thing tells you. Puts this thing within range of Russia. We are intentionally trying to be provocative without being escalatory. Operation Lead Lieutenant Colonel Lawrence Millincott told the U.S. military stripes outlet. We are trying to deter Russia aggression and expansionist behavior by showing enhanced capabilities of the NATO allies. The first question is, why would any normal person use freaking old C-130 or what have you, turboprop, which need to fly pretty high, that immediately gives you the hint that, yeah, it will be noted by the um, <laughs> long-range radar. And why would you need to put those four missiles in the transport plane and then drop them into this pallet, which contains our four missiles, and then they launch from that pallet, which flies down to Earth? I mean, towards the earth or sea, uh, sea surface. It's like, it is so bizarre. It is so, and the reason I'm saying it is bizarre because C-130 or the transport planes are the, the first casualty in any war. And that means you cannot send this thing. Granted, the JASM is a standoff munition. It has the range of about, depending on the, uh, variant so to speak of around 900 kilometers it is essentially a uh, slightly improved improved tomahawk you know s s stuck into this semi stealth you know uh, 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 hull and um, they think that okay we can lift you know all those c-130s you know with those things and they will drop them in those pallets and they will start flying towards Russian airspace well let me put it this way if you have good level bomber or attack, uh, attack aircraft, you can easily stick into their revolver uh, revolver facilities, so to speak, inside or outside 
much larger number of those JSONs, not to mention the fact that in Arctic, as they try to posture themselves, United States is not even a competitor, because United States doesn't have the Arctic forces, let alone icebreaker forces, let alone air defense forces, which Russia has. So it's all posturing. It is all about showing that United States matters militarily, but realistically speaking, and especially when one considers that actually one of the container over the horizon radars uh, of Russia is located on the uh, new land, Nova Zemlya, and basically airspace from uh, Brussels and actually from Great Britain to throughout all Europe is very well controlled and Russia see everything what is going on there. So in this case, I don't know what is the sense of this stupid thing, just dropping the container and, but I'm pretty sure that somebody made good money on that. Yeah, you know, somebody got their, uh, you know, ranks <laughs> improved by developing this absolutely stupid program because absolutely makes no military sense. But then again, as I already stated, a lot of things which are happening in Pentagon and this military industrial congressional complex, they don't make sense whatsoever from their tactical, operational and strategic sense. In the end, it is much easier and much more damaging, for example, much more dangerous to launch whatever the Tomahawks or Jasons will come on the, you know, on the American nuclear submarines, which can launch them from somewhere, I don't know, can I see? But, again, I'm, you know, basically drifting off a little bit from my, my main line today that actually what we see today and what is happening we see there, as I already spoke today with Brian and Gonzala, uh, and again, don't forget to visit that conversation, uh, that basically West is not really that much, uh, uh, not only incompetent, we knew they are incompetent, but they not really uh, uh, coherent in uh, providing any kind of the normal uh, logical solutions to anything. Uh, but then again, it was expected. So, because we have this uh, military, political, and other elites, so to speak, who are utterly incompetent and completely lost any kind of the situational awareness. And that will be my talk uh, for you today. And uh, as always, guys, uh, those who can afford, please support me on the Patreon. And those who like what I do, please subscribe to my channel. And uh, I'll be talking to you very soon. Have a nice upcoming weekend. Bye-bye.